Welcome to the Chorus from the Ten Lesser Students and Chatting the Deaf. Our first speaker this season is Mayor Margaret McCallum. She is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. She was raised on the Soil South Texas Ranch and writes about the history of the Southwest and Mexico. Her first book, Out of Letters Lived in Texas, began with research conducted by her grandmother and father. The family's history in Texas goes back many generations. This book won the San Antonio Conservation Society Publication Award and was featured title at the 2003 Texas Book Festival. The second book, A Brave Boy and a Good Chosen, is the biography of a young Texan captured in battle and later adopted by Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, President of Mexico. From the epilogue, the story of John Cici Hill is one of the most remarkable stories to emerge from Texas's struggle for independence. What makes this so compelling is that his adoption by Santa Ana was not motivated by politics or the payment of a personal debt. How many Texans were on this in Texas history? Mayor Larson has also been published in anthologies, including Texas Labor History, for which she wrote the essay, Better to Die on Our Feet to the, than to Live on Our Knees. United Strongworkers Strikes in the Lower Rio Grande Valley, 1966-1967. Those of you who have been coming to the countries for several years might recall that one of my previous speakers, Babylon Dallas West, was a shy of migrant farm worker in Texas who went on to advocate for migrants nationwide. Mayor Margaret is on the board of the Texas a and University Press and the Whitby Museum in San Antonio. As an incoming president of the Texas State Historical Association, she looks forward to promoting more research on and publication of North American history. Mayor Margaret's third book, her subject tonight, is Maximilian and Conopa, the last empire in Mexico. She says, the story of Maximilian and Carlotta is often overlooked in the history books. Many Mexican citizens do not know this brief but extraordinary episode, um, this brief but extraordinary episode in not only Mexican, but world history. This, this book is currently being filmed. And to tell you right this introduction, I asked Mary and Martha's sister, Melissa Dennis, who I've known as a friend and client for the last decade, to tell me a few things that I wouldn't find on the, on the internet or in an image dial. Even though Melissa was traveling in China, she wrote me back immediately. In my family, Mary and Martha is known for two things, her tenacity and her attention to detail. Both attributes are excellent for writers of history. She has a line on the shield track, so don't get into it the day with her, because you will lose quickly. Her knowledge of Texas and Mexican history is comprehensive, so if you ask her a question, we assume the answer will be complete. I love history. I love to read about history. Unfortunately, I do not have a skill track line, and I have had many of the details. But what I have found in many of my books is that she has a wonderful way of reading stories and facts together that captures my imagination and keeps my attention. So now, to talk about Maximilian and Carlotta is our guest tonight, Mary Margaret and the a long-time friend of my sister's, uh, Melissa Guerra, and um, I have to credit my sister, actually she never says such nice things to me personally, but she, she, uh, she got this, her father-in-law, um, well, her, her father-in-law, yeah, Mr. Enrique Guerra, got me interested in this uh, to begin with. He had, he acquired a fabulous collection in El Paso that came out of 
what was left of Maximilian's estate when he um, when he didn't ship the rest of his things home to uh, to Austria. And it, so looking at the collection, it was pretty fabulous. Also, uh, I grew up going to Mexico a lot as a kid when there, our border was, wasn't really a border. Um, my great uncle um, lived in Cuernavaca with my aunt, and he was a constitutionalist who signed the Constitution of 1917 after having served under Carranza in the Revolution. He eventually became um, the Minister of Aviation for Mexico and was successful in bringing Pan American down to Mexico, which today is Me Mexicana Airlines. So I would go all the time, uh, fly to Mexico City, go down to Cuernavaca and spend time at their beautiful home, and um, which was on, if you know Cuernavaca at all, it's surrounded by what was called the Barranca, <coughs> and their home backed up to that. and. Um, they would tell stories about Maximilian and Carlota. They would take me to um, to uh, the Cortez's palace, which was offered to him at one point as a home. He ended up uh, developing a home at the La Borla house. It was an old magnate's, a silver magnate's house. And then he also built another place called El Olindo uh, at Acapatzingo, which uh, was his uh, Maximilian's place where he met his lovers. So um, when they would talk about Maximilian, it was almost just as, le as though he had left the building. It was, it was, even though it was 100 years later, but it was very vivid in the minds of the people there, um, especially because he spent so much time there with a particular girlfriend, as it was. So um, I had this very early um, exposure to that story, and then little signs kept showing up in the universe that uh, Perhaps I should do this. Another friend of mine in Austin acquired another large collection of what was left over from Maximilian and um, in trade for me translating the letters that came with that. I got to see this giant rosary made out of ivory and ebony, no doubt, produced in the Philippines. And the exquisite wealth that the, the, they had. Um, Maximilian had a poncho that was with the symbols of uh, his his um, his method, as you'd say, his his symbolism as not only the religious leader but the emperor of Mexico with his giant silver botones, very very beautiful. And so we had an exhibit at the Wedding Museum when this book kicked off. Anyway, I'm pleased to have been um, invited here by Charlie and by Sanders and Snedos. I want to thank Signa Hammer and um, Yun, Yun, Yunuan Vital and Lucina Kaplan, who've all worked on this project to bring this together. So I will begin, as I explained, this strange and lovely history of Emperor Maximilian and Empress Carlota is one of the most enigmatic in this country's history, probably even the world. Outside of Chapultepec and Cuernavaca, this is not often spoke about or taught anywhere. This period of history largely celebrated with the progressive measures of Benito Juarez and his cadre of intellectuals from Oaxaca was severely punctuated by seven years of French occupation and the installation of Maximilian von Habsburg and his wife Carlota as emperor and empress of Mexico. Um, here we are. Maximilian von Habsburg was born on July 6, 1832 at the Royal Summer Palace of Schoenbrunn as the second child of Archduke Franz Karl and Archduchess Sophie of Austria. Through, through a number of com complications of succession, most of the mental health of Franz Karl, who seated there in the top hat, um, Sophie convinced her husband to abdicate, to allow their son, Franz Josef, standing here at the uh, your far left, to become Austria's emperor. Maximilian, who loved the arts, and had a more liberal viewpoint of rule, thought his brother was a boring and brutal martinet. So there's the entire family sitting there at uh, Schoenberg. Uh, there, if you've ever been to Vienna, the main palace is the, uh, the Hofburg, where all of the beautiful things um, are located from their reigns. After Ma Maximilian, this whole family believed in noblesse oblige, but they also believed they were divinely um, created from from Jesus, from God, and 
So they felt like wherever they went in life, they could rule. And in fact, a lot of them would get picked up by different countries to come in and rule. Um, the Habsburgs were a pretty global family in that regard. So um, with his brother as emperor, Axelian was assigned to the Austrian Navy, having been an officer from the early age. He was placed at the head of the Austrian fleet and loved visiting countries to learn their customs and languages. Um, he was a very joyful kind of guy. As a representative of the royal family, he was encouraged to know leaders across Europe. In his travels, he met Napoleon III, who was the nephew of Napoleon I, uh, who had this great mind that he was the reincarnation of, of Caesar, even, um, and wrote a biography of Caesar. He met with him at Chateau, Chateau Saint-Cloud, uh, which no longer exists, uh, near Paris. And Maximilian, while thinking his court was rather crude, came to admire the continuation of the utopian Napoleonic ideas, the vision and goals to civilize and bring up society and other cultures of the world. And he uh, was a colonizer du, du jour. Um, they, Napoleon had conquered sections of China, Crimea, and Northern Africa, and was I in parts of Japan at the time that this subject came up. When the United States Civil War broke out, it was evident that no longer could the United States be any sort of protector to Mexico. And which, you know, Mexico has a complicated relationship with the United States. They're very no me toques and, and like, don't tell me what to do, but they need us still, we need them. Uh, so it's been that way for centuries. Um, so after Napoleon III visited with him, and Maximilian was convinced he was a pretty great guy, Napoleon loaned him his yacht, and he sailed to Belgium to meet Leopold I, the first king of Belgium. There he met and fell in love with Maria Charlotte, Carlotta, their beautiful princess named for Leopold's first wife, the English royal Charlotte of Wales, who had passed away in, in childbirth. As Carlotta's mother, the last princess of France, died when Carlotta was only 10 years old, she stayed close to her father's side through most days as he attended to matters of state. Carlotta was also a close niece to Victoria in England. And let me just add on here that Leopold reorganized the country of Belgium from the top to the bottom, uh, re-educated the higher, the total educational system. And so she came away with it's a bucolic country, not very violent, and mostly neutral, as they were in World War I and II. So she's coming from a very sort of background of naivete, uh, the way things ought to be are very, very different than in many places in the world. So uh, she comes in with sort of a, a very uh, placid background, if you will, although she's rather aggressive and um, very ambitious. Maximilian and Carlotta married on June 27, 1857, at the family chapel in Lincoln, Brussels, just months after Maximilian's appointment as governor of Lombardy, Venetia, or northern Italy, as you probably know, which Austria then held. Maximilian was expected to hold the region against France, which at the time threatened to take possession. Maximilian was also expected to foster good relations with Pope Pius IX, one of the most conservative popes in history. He believed in papal infallibility, which means he could do no wrong. Um, he also had epilepsy, interestingly, <laughs> which he controlled um, just through sheer will. How, however, Maximilian's rule over Northern Italy proved to be highly he had proved to be highly unpopular with the people. In April 1859, when Austria made demands, war broke out with France, and Maximilian failed to adequately de deploy the Austrian fleet, fearing that they were no match for the French Navy. Therefore, Francius was forced to cede northern Italy, and Maximilian lost his job. He and Carlotta bought parcels of land in the North Adriatic Sea, near a town called Trieste, which you've probably heard of. It's a great university town, where they planned a small castle uh, to be called Miramare. It was a lovely project for both of them, but Carlotta especially, craving responsibilities and rule, sought more. And let me just say that at the time, a uh, number of Habsburgs were being re, uh, there was a big recolonization going on by European countries of um, Latin America. Pedro II, of, uh, who was a Habsburg, uh, became emperor of Brazil, for instance, which 
uh, was a highly coveted part of, of, of the world because of its natural resources, albeit Bethlehem probably only um, even knew maybe 10% of that country, which was, as you know, is a complicated place. So he decided, Maximilian does, to go visit his, his uh, esteemed co uh, cousin, Bethlehem II, and so he and Charlotte head off for Brazil. But about, but making port at Madeira, apparently they had a big fight, some row. And so Carlota was like, I'm not going with you. You know, I'm staying here in Madeira, which she did. And he went off to see Pedro too. And he was a great um, admirer of taxonomy and naming of new species and studying insects and all of that. So he had a marvelous time in Brazil. He was horrified by the slavery in Brazil at the ranches, but uh, he was fascinated by the fauna and floral and the diversity. And he also enjoyed going into the Brazilian mines, and there he bought uh, a number of uh, beautiful gems uh, to give to Carlota. One of them is called the Maximilian Diamond. That was owned uh, by Melba Marcos, and recently came up for sale and sold for well over a million dollars. Um, so, in Miramare, when I visited in 2009 doing my original um, research throughout Europe, I visited there and there was a period movie going on, of all things, a uh, big shot there about the lives and romance of Franz Josef and his very famous wife, Sissy. And so the actors all posed for me, and it was a magical moment in the research, a very good sign from the writer's universe. Uh, here's the cast and crew welcoming me. I was, and it was, it was stunning because the sailors down there at the mole, which in Spanish is a muele, you know, the, the dock, here they are in the ribbon caps and just the exact, exact copies of what they were in Max, Maximilian's day. This woman was too hot, so she exposed her um, corset uh, as I was taking her picture. So anyway, that was just a wonderful moment. If we'll go to the next slide. These people helped to concoct the monarchy of, of Mexico. Since Spain's loss of Mexico in 1821, as you probably know, monarchists in Mexico and abroad have been complaining about the chaos of Mexican government. Between 1823 and 1863, 40 years, Mexico had 54 presidential administrations in that 40 year period. The monarchists called Mexico a failed state, adding that monarchists in their effort to restore Mexico to a constitutional empire should be done with the monarchists and the church. With the rise of Benito Juarez, he took apart the church, um, mostly because they were so controlling of government. They, at the time Juarez took office, the Catholic Church owned over three billion pesos in property. Three billion, and that was in those dollars then, those pesos back then. The, the rent of those lands supported the church and its control over the people. Juarez, however, aided by Miguel Lerdo de Tejada, seized many of those lands to build a, a government treasury. Their other, only other source of income was the aduana taxes, or import tariffs. Therefore, Archbishop Pelagio uh, Antonio Malastila, who opposed Juarez, went into exile in Europe because he could not get uh, Juarez to change his ways. He and other monarchists prevailed on Pope Pius IX and Napoleon III for support, um, to support the plan. Napoleon's wife, a Spaniard named Eugenia de Montico, supported the plan. She was an ardent, uh, ardent Catholic and assisted by monarchists Jose Maria Gutierrez de Estrada and Jose Manuel Hidalgo, both Mexican-born criollos who had not set foot in Mexico for many years, still believed a monarchy would work. Of course, these were beneficiaries of Hennequin plantations, you know, in, um, in, the, uh, in the southern parts of, of Mexico, all the way to Campeche. Next slide. Um, Napoleon and Eugenia. Eugenia and Hidalgo convinced Napoleon that France would successfully invade Mexico to restore a monarchy. When Juarez took office on January 1, 1861, he suspended the repayments of bond debt to France, England, and Spain incurred during the La Reforma that he had fought because he said, I didn't enter into those 
uh, debt agreements, it was Miguel Miramon. Miguel Miramon had been what, what became one of Maximilian's most important generals, but he had briefly been president of, uh, of Mexico, and he did borrow a lot of bond debt. With uh, the rationalization to enter Mexico to seize it, Napoleon devised a scheme to reclaim the bond debt and convinced the monarchies of England and Spain to accompany them to invade the country. So today, bond debt results in sanctions. It, back then, it resulted in a little flotilla landing on your beach. So while making plan military plans, Eugenia and Hidalgo proposed Maximilian von Habsburg as the emperor because he wasn't doing anything. <laughs> so they're like, we think she slapped her breast with her fan saying, I know Maximilian will do this for us. After warning the Mexican government that it was in default of debt, in January 1862, various Marines, Zuaves, and infantry arrived at Veracruz, disembarking horses and materials to lay siege to the country by way of Puebla. Generals Jean-Pierre Jurien de Gravier and Count Charles Ferdinand Latrille stopped only long enough in, in Veracruz to organize, citing the danger of yellow fever, and commenced going to the upper plateaus of Orizaba. And as you know, yellow fever, or Bonito Prieto, if you survived it, you never got it again. But chances are you, as a European, were highly susceptible to it, and thousands of guys died as they arrived. When England and Spain quickly surmised that France had another goal other than to reclaim bond debt, they made guarantees with the Juarez administration and got out. General Loden says, aided by General Leonardo Marquez, marched west through the highlands through Paso del Macho, the river valleys of Chiquihuite, Cordoba, Barranca de San Miguel, Orizaba, Palmar, Amosto, and on to Puebla. They arrived on in April 1862 and on May 5 de Mayo, advanced on Puebla to face the army of uh, Ignacio Zaragoza aided by Porfirio Diaz. The muddy and slick hills proved to be too much for the French army and they retreated. Nice. Um, frustrated and furious by this monumental loss, Napoleon, with the biggest, most trained, well-funded army in the world, sent another 28,000 men to Veracruz in September, while the remainder of the French troops remained near Orizaba. Why they, the Mexicans didn't kick them out of the country, I have no idea. General Luis, I think it has, was a money thing. Uh, General Luis Elia Fori arrived in Veracruz in September 1862 with thousands of men, hundreds of horses and provisions and wagons. Another major contingent of 20,000 arrived with General Francois Aquil Bassan, who was a sage but a jaded man, with experience in Algeria, Morocco, and the Crimea. Even his tent was from Morocco. Bazin quickly cleaned up the facilities infected by men with yellow fever. He brought in Arab soldiers because of their immunity to yellow fever because they had a high rate of sickle cell anemia. So they didn't get the forming of the which was spread by mosquitoes. And they were ready to make another attack on Puebla. Bazin had roads built, houses demolished, and brush cleared for a more strategic bombing. The soldiers of, of uh, through 1863, soldiers arrived from 22 different nations, and you can see some of their costumes here. These included European countries, but places dominated by France as well are doing business with France, such as China, Algeria, the Sudan, and Egypt. And from Egypt, uh, the, the leaders of Egypt would work with France to round up slaves to send to Mexico to be soldiers. Some came to see, the, and then from Europe, some came to see a foreign land, some gained, gained rank in the military, some men were from noble families, other soldiers of fortune, or part of the French Foreign Legion. And they were assembled under their own commanders, or, to the next slide, the four Imperial <coughs> Generals, Tomas Mejia, Ramon Mendez, Miguel Miramon, and Leonardo Marquez, the four Amos would uh, uh, unite under the fifth M, Maximiliano. Next, the next uh, slide shows that the most deadly killer of them all was the leader of the counter guerrillas. This was Charles Dupin, who had served in China during France's conquest of Shanghai, but was caught looting the summer palace of natural treasures to cover uh, gambling debts. By agreeing to serve in Mexico, he regained his rank 
And, uh, and his duty was to clear the path ahead of the French army by investigating and clearing, and clearing the area using guerrilla fighters, often stooping to horribly brutal tactics. By May 17, 1863, after a 60-day siege and bombardment of Puebla, you can tell they bombed the hell out of that place, the, the Mexican army surrendered and fled the region. By the fall of 1863, almost all of Mexico was occupied by the French, both coasts and all the ports, and most of the major cities and towns. So here's a headline from the newspapers showing uh, the, they almost had it. They almost had it all. But, uh, but they estimate, uh, underestimated the me Mexican tenacity. Upon the arrival of the French in Mexico City, General Foray began to set up a provisional government and a city ayuntamiento. On May 31st, as his forlorn army struggled back to Mexico City, Benito Juarez fled north with his family and the records of state to San Luis Potosí with Imperial General Tomas Mejia on his heels. Eventually, Juarez's family and nine fled by sea to New York City, where they would remain for the rest of the French occupation. Sadly, Juarez would lose two of his sons to illness during their stay in New York. Juarez himself fled into the deserts of northern Chihuahua, in places so remote the French would not find him. And then his generals began to desert him. Meanwhile, on October 2nd, 1863, the delegation of Mexican monarchists was assembled in Vienna and traveled to Trieste to invite Maximilian to be Emperor of Mexico. Wisely, however, Maximilian said he would accept, but only provisionally. He asked for a plebiscite, or a vote of the population of Mexico to vote in, in as emperor, which was interesting. <laughs> By May 1864, town after town had fallen to the Imperialista army, and Basad had a whole villages sign petitions calling for a monarchy. Well, many of these people couldn't even write, so he would accept X or family representatives, what have you. Maximilian, interestingly then, invited Benito Juarez to serve as his prime minister of the New Mexican Empire. Astonished Juan and Juarez no, no doubt, declined the offer, writing, I'm amazed on one hand that, of your generosity, and of the other, my surprise has been great to read your letter, the words spontaneous summons, that Maximilian Robert was saying, I've been spontaneously summoned to, your, to run your country. He said, for I've already perceived that when the traitors of my country appeared at me to offer you the crown, this whole thing was a sham. So, no go with that. After the plebiscite, on, on April 2nd, the Mexican delegation reappeared at Miramar to again formally offer Maximilian the throne. Although he accepted, he was deeply troubled by this decision. And I love this painting. It's done by a guy named Alfred Buse, who became the official painter uh, uh, for France in this whole thing. And so he did a whole series of paintings of all the sections of, of the time Maximilian was traveling. And, you know, uh, and Carmelita in the field, she was a great uh, horseback rider, very rare in Mexico for that, to, for a woman to ride, uh, although she rode sides up. And this damask that he had made for me on is almost exactly like the damask that hangs in Chapultepec, but it's red. Um, let's see, on the next day, April 11th, with teary farewells from the people of Trieste, Maximilian sailed from the Mole the Muele at Miramari on the Austrian flagship Navarra, accompanied by the smaller craft of Temis. Maximilian Carlota arrived at Veracruz almost seven weeks later on May 28, 1865, to little activity in the bay or welcome from the shore. From the ships, they could see the vast cemeteries at Veracruz called Le Jardin de Aclamacion, due to the thousands of European soldiers who had died due to the bomb of Prieto. When the Imperial delegation was not even in Veracruz, so worried about yellow fever, because this was summer, they remained waiting in Orizaba until they got the word, and then they came down to the lowlands. They had to wait about a day until they could arrive. After greeting them, they all floated out in the evening and, and got on deck of the, um, of the uh, Novara with their lanterns and welcomed him, and he said, Maximilian was very touched and he introduced him to Carlota and he said, made a big speech, starting with Mexicans who have desired my presence. <laughs> the royals 
and their large entourage with 500 pieces of luggage traveled to La Soledad um, by, by rail. The conductor of the Royal Orchestra and his wife rode on a burro overland as most of the entourage transferred to carriages and coaches. Over the 300-mile trip, Carlota worried about Juarez gorillas. As they neared Cordoba, Car Carlota's coach overturned in, dry in a driving rainstorm. But she got up saying, I'm okay, folks. I almost lost a rib, but I'm okay. I'm so excited to be here. They made their way to Orizaba, where they met members of the Naranjal community, which is an Indian group. And afterward, Carlota chose to ride her horse for the remainder of the trip through the Cumbres to Puebla, Cholula, and then to the plain of Manawa. Carlota knows the great poverty of the countryside compared to the wealth, relative wealth and civilization in the towns. She said, according to all I have seen, a monarchy is feasible in this country in response to the unanimous needs of the people. Nonetheless, however, it may, remains a giant experiment, for we have to struggle against wilderness, distance, roads, and the most utter chaos. The level of civilization in the country presents astonishing contract, contrast. And then she added, everything must be reordered from the bottom to the top. At the shrine of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, Maximilian and Carlota finally meet French General Vincent and most of their Mexican imperialist generals. And by the way, they were very intrigued by the legend of Nuestra Señora there at the church of the Basilica. On June 12, Maximilian and Carlota entered Mexico City to fanfare and welcome from the people and the clergy. Two weeks of festivities followed with dinners, bullfights, horsemanship exhibitions, and, and balls and uh, all sorts of dinners, breakfasts, but yet they could hear beyond the, you have to remember Mexico City had a wall around it, just beyond the walls they could hear the baristas retaliating gunfire and cannon fire. Carlota wore her Bourbon and Habsburg jewels and her fine gowns. The royals spent their first nights in the National Palace, which was crumbling and had bed bugs. So they quickly decided to move to Chapultepec, an 18th century palace built on a high basalt hill known as Grasshopper Hill. The palace had a magnificent view of the lakes Chalco, Texcoco, Xochimilco, as well as the volcanoes of Popocatépetl and Isasiwa. Maximilian brought in our Austrian architects and builders to enlarge and modernize the palace along with silk damask wallpaper with the imperial model's motto, Equidad en la Justicia, Equity and Justice. With William Nechtel, landscape designer at Miramare, Carlota busied herself with redesigning the gardens of, of Chapultepec, being sure to save the ancient Huehuete well, trees, the big uh, cypress trees that are legendary there. Maximilian, who loved taxonomy, as mentioned, commissioned a portly Belgian priest named Dominic Billemet, who was trained in zoology and botany to capture and document all era, area flora, fauna, and insects. And a number of his species, some named for him, are actually in the Austrian Natural History Museum in Vienna. Soon, Maximilian and his crew began to adopt as many ways as possible. While he spoke 10 languages, he insisted on conducting most business in Spanish. Celebrating Madre Hidalgo's 1810 call for an independence from Mexico, September 16th in, Dodo, in Dolores Hidalgo, he adopted and modified the riding clothes of the jinete, the, the riding rider, making the charlotte pants more slender through the legs to tuck into boots. He also commissioned a very lavishly embroidered saddle, a pitiado saddle, that he sent with the goat hair chaps, black goat hair, that he sent to his brother, Franz Josef, in at Schoenbrunn. And when I went to go see that saddle, the um, man at the Wagenberg, who's the curator, showed me where it was entered into the books in 1864. And it was entered as the beautiful saddle made for Franz Josef, complete with a pair of gorilla leggings. <laughs> And, and the curator asked me, are there gorillas in Mexico? <laughs> and I said, not to my knowledge. And I said, but I will tell you, those are black, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the black goat hair chaps, um, the, the, the chivo. And anyway, it's just a number of interesting that some of the things I saw at Chapultepec I would see also in Austria. It was a great uh, comparative analysis. 
French General Achille Bas Francois was saying, found love and married Pepito de la Peña. I think we're two ahead here. Uh, oh wait, no, we're not. We're I skipped. Um, this is a, a, a photo, if we could go back, of Maximilian as a staff playing cricket on the fields below Chapultepec. Through this area, he laid out the Paseo de la Reforma from Chapultepec, terminating at a statue called El Caballito of Charles IV of Spain, near today's Bay of He also made a plan of fountains, electric clocks, street improvements, and draining some of the lakes to make Mexico City more like a European capital. Soon, Maximilian and his crew began to adopt, oh, I said this already, the chaps and the uh, accoutrement of the Mexican jinete. And here you can see the jaguar chaps of Feliciano Rodriguez, who, um, he, uh, these were like the ultimate stud clothes. I mean, I had badass, you know, kind of clothes. And um, so you talk about slouchy pants today, that's nothing new. So, um, then, as uh, French General Francois Kilbassin found love and married Pepita de la Peña, 25 years younger and the daughter of Aquatus General, this greatly amused Maximilian that she was so young and wrote that to his family. Uh, the Mexican imperialists appreciated French foods, uh, customs, and music, as well as the beer of the Belgians and Austrians. The cultural blending began through the country, especially through the elites. Uh, despite the violence and the conflict. So there he is, a new man. So, and I love the, the puppy. The, and I mean, you, you think when you read history, sometimes you don't think of these people as being real, but there they are in all reality, a little poodle. Um, Maximilian marveled at the diversity of Mexico and welcomed Indians to Chapultepec. Here are the Kickapoos asking for assistance to return their lands after being harassed by soldiers along the Texas border during the U.S. Civil War. Carlota busied herself with a morning ride with Maximilian each day, then joining him at breakfast and working uh, most, in most days in the office. She acted sort of as a secretary and a, an administrator. But she also took long excursions into the countryside, protected by battalions of the French army. While Maximilian at first seemed keen on restoring church properties which had been sold to raise vessels for the national treasure, upon his arrival, he saw that returning the properties to the church was impossible and absurd. And this infuriated the monarchists and the church authorities, who then started to turn their backs on Maximilian. Meanwhile, in 1865, the French struggled to maintain dominance over the Mexican Republicans. When a unit would leave the area, the Mexican Republicans would claim, reclaim the place within a, a few weeks. France's hold on Mexico was starting to crumble, and Maximilian was doing little to build his own domestic army. There was infighting between the French, Belgians, Austrians, and other troops who refused to be commanded by a Mexican general. The French army made heavier use of the infamous Charles Dupin to attack villages with French Foreign Legion and Arab soldiers. He'd ride into a, a village, demand information or food, and when it was not forthcoming, he would burn the village and kill the men. One consul general reported that at one town, Dupin ordered the murder of all captives, whose heads, in quote, whose heads are at once severed from their bodies and sported with as footballs, while the chief looks on with a complacency on savage scenes. Carlotta called him the monster of the hotlands, the Huasteca, and Maximilian ordered him back to France, only to have Napoleon send him back to Mexico, being convinced that the country would not be conquered without Dupin's leadership. Sometime after their arrival in Mexico, with the consideration that they had not born a child, Maximilian adopted Agustin de Iturbide, the grandson of the first post-Spanish emperor, Agustin de Iturbide I, who was executed in 1824 paying each family member 150,000 pesos, a very large sum of money even in the day. The family allowed Augustine to be adopted with his aunt, Josefina, uh, remaining with him as the nanny. The family collected the first third in Mexico and coll could collect the rest of the money in Paris, an assurance that they would not only leave Mexico City, but that they would leave the country. Alice, his mother, though, went into extreme grief and asked for the boy to be returned and visited Maximilian, who would not see her, and then his second-in-command, who told her that it was impossible, 
and uh, but he would see what they could do. They put her in a carriage, promising her that she could see her son. Well, they drove her all the way to Veracruz and put her on a ship, and she left for Europe. So um, it was a very strange um, part of that story. At the end of the U.S. Civil War, May 1865, the Americans knew that the French occupied Mexico remained a problem for Reconstruction, mostly because so many Confederates fled into Mexico, re refusing to you know, answer the or dance to the music of the Union Army. General Phil Sheridan, who said the war will never be over until the French leave Mexico, was sent to the Rio Grande with guns, tents, medications, and medications to leave at various spots for the troops loyal to bodies. In fact, Sheridan had to miss the big celebration of parade in Washington, D.C. because Andrew Johnson said, well, uh, Bill Sheridan was sent by Sherman, uh, to, essentially. As a result, the generals Porfirio Diaz in the south and Mariano Escobedo in the north began to revitalize. Despite the positioning of area Gaudillos, which are local leaders, across northern Mexico and their jealousies, Escobedo began to build up a sizable army. After much skirmishing at the end of 1865, 60 raiders, mostly African Americans, crossed the river and sh sacked the shipping town of Baghdad, which is just sat down river from Matamoros. So you have to understand, during the Civil War, 350,000 bales of southern cotton went through the Atamana at Matamoros, gleaning a huge profit for the Mexican uh, uh, treasury. And, it, and Maximilian really uh, lamented its loss because it, it produced so much money because Lincoln had blockaded every pub, every port from Maine all the way up down the Gulf Coast. So what did they do? They sent southern cotton to Matamoros, put it on a Mexican ship, got it out to Antwerp or, uh, uh, or to Manchester or wherever it was going because Europe needed the cotton, mostly for underwear, ironically. They <laughs> captured 300 soldiers and burned the warehouse. The next day, General Mejia surrendered his troops, moving the Imperial Army out of Matamoros and back to Veracruz. It was a major loss for the Imperial government. So, um, and the next slide. Uh, dissident groups grew by the day. An attack on a 200 wagon train pulled by 2,000 mules bearing 3 million in merchandise was attacking in Monterey. The Austrians suffered in the heat as the train made its way slowly south. The, they were suffering from extreme thirst because they hadn't put on enough water on their teams. So they began drinking wine, which <laughs> made their dehydration worse and resulted in terrible dysentery. And so in this weakened condition, the Republican general Mariano Escobedo and his snipers killed half of the imperialist columns of nearly 2,000 men. Escobedo seized a thousand muskets, artillery, ammunition, and even the musical instruments that were destined for the Imperial Orchestra in Mexico City. That by then, Mejia packed up his fifth division. You can see the French Foreign Legion there in the front and the sailors in the back. Um, this is a very super rare photograph of uh, the Lodo Rio Grande and them clearing out. And then they went by way of Campico where they had one shipwreck and then landed in Veracruz. And the Barista generals were infuriated because they had allowed him to escape. So, uh, with meanwhile, on January 15th, with France losing scads of francs on the Mexican expedition, and in the face of Germany's Audubon Bismarck planning unification, Napoleon decided to close his account with Mexico. He recalled the French troops and offered that the send a Maximilian to build his own domestic army, which to that day had been a failure. Napoleon wanted his troops home by the end of the year. The other possibility was to talk Maximilian into abdicating. Maximilian, in poor health, considered abdication and discussed the matter with Bassan. Carlota, however, stepped in and argued that a king does not deserve his post. She said, in quote, she wrote a long series of letters about this, there's just one step from pathetic to ridiculous. We were here to start out as champions of civilization, as the liberators and regenerators, and then to withdraw on the plea that there's nothing to civilize. All this is under an agreement with France, which is always passed for the country of intellectual power. You will admit for both sides this would be the greatest absurdity committed under the sun. Even if it is permitted to play with single individuals, one does not play, play with nations. 
for God avenges us. They decided then that she would travel to Paris to persuade Napoleon to leave the troops in Mexico. On July 9th, Carlota with a heavy heart left for Europe. She told her ladies in waiting that she would return in three months. Maximilian went with her as far as Bodhisattva, but then he suffered, um, then, and ordered many of his possessions to be packed and moved with her. At Veracruz, the town was full of French soldiers preparing to sail for France. Carlota had arrived in France on August 8th at Port Mazar. She found Napoleon recuperating from a bladder illness in his palace of St. Pete. While she was waiting to see him, he was also she was also confronted by Alice Green, the mother of Agustini Duguide, the little boy. She wanted her son back, and it was a funny conversation because uh, Garota told her, you are much changed since I last, last saw you. And, and Alice said something like, so have you. <laughs> and so being older and more, more stressed out. And so Carlota told her to write to Maximilian again, and she said, this time write politely. So after being put off by Eugenia and Napoleon for a few days, she arrived in August at St. Cloud. There she pleaded him not to withdraw the French troops, that they were working diligently. She had a plan for renewing bond, debt, and a, rent, a plan to refinance. Napoleon was reduced to tears and said little. After the end of a series of tense meetings that week, finally Carlotta announced, in spite to him, we will abdicate. And he looked up at her and just said, abdicate. So calling Napoleon the devil in person, Carlotta left with her retinue to the castle Miramare in Trieste, still under construction. Maximilian asked her to prevail upon Pope Pius IX, then on September 18th she traveled to Rome. Upon her arrival at the Auberge de Roma, Carlotta began to act very nervous. She could not sleep, she started to refuse food. On September 27th, she met with Pius. Carlotta handed him a draft of a concordant of agreements for the church to support them in Mexico, all of which had been canceled. The next day, while she refused to eat food prepared for her, she summoned her carriage to take her to the Trevi Fountain, where she filled a pitcher with water. She had only eaten oranges that she peeled or nuts that she cracked herself. She sent her um, maid, Matilda Doblinger, to go to the market and buy chickens, which she tied to the piano legs in her room, and brought in a little stove, and Matilda had to cook, cook a clean, kill, clean, and cook the chicken. Um, while Carlota watched to make sure she was not going to be poisoned. Paranoid that Napoleon had sent somebody to kill her, on September 30th, having little eat to, eat to eat or sleep, the pale Carlota arrived unannounced at the Vatican and demanded to see the pawn. She entered his chambers and asked for his help, that somebody was attempting to poison her. When Pius offered her something to eat, she eyed his cup of chocolate dipped three fingers into the cup and tasted it. I was so hungry, she said. After falling with Hanif around for several hours, his, assist his assistants distracted her with illuminated manuscripts in Vatican Library. She asked to spend the night, afraid that Napoleon had sent someone to murder her. Pius acquiesced, allowing her and her lady in waiting to spend the night in the Vatican Library. Eventually, her brother took her back to Italy, where she lived her life out in Belgium. There's a lot more to that story, but I'm, I'm sum summarizing. After Napoleon III vowed not to spend another ecu on Mexico, Bassam tried to convince Maximilian to leave with him. He said, it's all been a bubble. You have to face it, he told Maximilian. He, Maximilian agreed to abdicate, but his cadre of advisors, especially a corrupt priest named Augustine Fischer, persuaded him to stay. The final decision, however, as he remained in Odisala, ready to leave for Europe were two letters, one that he received from Franz Josef that said he would not restore his title or his um, monthly allowance if he came back to Austria. The second was Maximilian's mother, Sophie, who said that a Habsburg never left his post. Bassan left with his Mexican family on the last ship out of Veracruz on, in March 1867. Having decided to stay, Max Maximilian rode with his best two horses, Orisvelo and Anteburro, which means um, taper in, in Spanish, for a taper in Brazil, to the, uh, to the gathering scene of a bat the battle between the imperialistas and Juarez at Querétaro, 
away from the valuable capital. Canetero had been fortified over the last three years by the SAD as a supported northern bulwark in case the United States charged south into Mexico, which they thought they would. The city, full of convents and churches, supported the imperial cause as well as prepared for siege. However, as he rode into town, Orisfello, his war horse, stumbled on the cobblestones, considered a bad omen since the Middle Ages. At Queretaro, Maximilian and his four generals convened, each with a particular duty to defend the city for, for, for the imperial government. Marquez served as head of staff, Miramon Juan commanded the infantry, Mejia the cavalry, and Mendes the reserves. The liberals succeeded in bombing the town as Maximilian and his friends defended, and his men defended. Maximilian was known to walk out into the open bombing fields as if he waited for a lucky bullet. Slowly, the imperialistas began to run out of munitions and food. Eventually, the liberals damaged the city's famous aqueduct, cutting off water to the town. Leonardo Marcus, using a disguised sortie to raid through the front lines, left Queretaro ostensibly to get reinforcements from Mexico City and more wine, incidentally, <laughs> and he never came back. After a 71-day siege, Maximilian was betrayed by one of his aides, Miguel Lopez. In fact, Maximilian was the godfather of his children. He and his team of 15 generals and 357 officers were arrested by Benito Juarez's men, who appointed Maximilian defense lawyers. Two of three were Fred Hall from the U.S. and Mariano Riva Palacios, the father of a Juarista general. Maximilian did not appear at the trial of the Teatro Imperial, too ill with dysentery, but moreover, really, he knew it would be a phantom trial. Maximilian then was imprisoned in the Teresitas convent. The first night of his imprisonment, he was ordered to sleep in the crypt with the nuns, the dead nuns, and one of his aides as well. He said, this is not good. I cannot sleep in a bed with the dead, but they made him do it anyway. A little bed was set up for him, and he read the history of Italy by Cesare Cartu that night. The next day, he was transferred to the Convento de la Cruz, as were most of his retinue. And if you know the, the story of La Cruz, there's, a, there's a, a great plant that grows there with the spinas. It's a, it's a honey locust, is what it locust is what it's called. And the thorns grow in the shape of crosses. If you've never been there, you should go. It's fabulous. Um, many of Mexican support, uh, Maximilian supporters traveled to San Luis Potosí to beg Juarez for Mexi Maximilian's life. And as you know, Mexico did not have the death penalty, but this was an exception um, for Juarez. At one point, Princess Agnes Samsung, an American-born wife of Prussian General Felix Su Samsung, who, who, who fought for the imperialists, traveled on her, in, on her own in a little yellow fiacre to beg Juarez not to kill Maximilian. At one point on her knees, grasping Juarez about the legs, crying. And he had to pull her up, saying, woman, this grieves me so to see you this way, but if I do not kill Maximilian, the people will fall upon me. World leaders, including Andrew Johnson, Italian intellectuals, and the Habsburg family in Austria wrote to Juarez to spare Maximilian's life. On June 19th, 18, and as you know, he was convicted. On June 19th, 1867, after an early morning mass, Maximilian was conveyed to the Cerro de las Campanas for his execution. He removed his hat, wiped his brow with his kerchief, and gave them to his Hungarian chef, Tudos, asking them to give them to his mother. And then he gave each man in the firing squad a centenario. Do you all know what those are, centenario? The gold, big gold coins. Um, asking them not to hit him in the face so that his mother might recognize him when he returned. Then he gave a brief statement, and I'll paraphrase. Mexicans, men of my class and origin, are appointed by God to be the happiness of people or their martyrs. I came for the good of the country. I did not come for ambition, but the best wishes for my future of my adopted country. I hope that my blood will be the last to be spilled, and I pray that it regenerates this unhappy country. Viva Mexico, viva la independencia. He placed his hands on his hips, pulling back his waistcoat, and looked to heaven. And this we know because I just visited uh, a year ago with the curator at the Hofburg, who takes care of the last clothing of Maximilian was sent back with all the bullet holes back to Vienna. And what's interesting is while there are bullet holes through the vest and out the back of the jacket, there are none in the jacket the, it, themselves. So what we know from that is that he stood like this, like 
he was going to be shot. And he looked to the heavens, according to uh, eyewitnesses. So, uh, with photos not allowed, Francois Albert, the official court photographer, made this quick uh, sketch of the scene. And Maximilian was shot with uh, Miguel Miramon and Tomas Mejia. So there they are, getting ready to be shot on top of Cerro uh, de las Campanas. After his execution, William Seward, who had served under Abraham Lincoln as uh, in the government, and as you know, is the one who got Alaska for the United States, William Seward in Washington received a telegram from Emperor Franz Joseph asking him to intervene in the executions. If Maximilian was allowed to leave, Franz Joseph said he, he could return to Austria with his title of Archduke intact and restoration of the royal allowance. But it arrived one day too late. Last month, through my work with the Witte Museum in San Antonio, a board member, Inigo Arzac, who was a Mexican national, brought a letter to my attention. It was the last letter written from Maximilian to Carlota, just before his execution. He wrote it in Spanish and gave it to the commander of the firing squad with the hope out of symphony, a sympathy, he would send it. However, it was handed over to the governor of Querétaro um, and uh, made its way through the government somewhere, handed down through his family, and his aunt in Durango had this. And it was in the exact handwriting of, it was either Luis Blasio's handwriting, who was the secretary of Maximilian, or Maximilian himself. I know the signature is for sure true. I'm pretty sure that this was Maximilian's handwriting himself. It says, my beloved Carlota, if God permits that one day we will be together and that you read these lines, I'm sure you will understand the cruel luck that has left me without consolation after your departure for Europe. You took with you my fortune and my soul because I've not heard your voice so many months. Oh no, where he says, I. After all the strikes that have destroyed the wellspring of my dreams, such that death is, for me, a happy place and not agony. I fall gloriously like a soldier, like a defeated king, but not undone. If you are still suffering, may God call you soon to join me, blessed by the divine hand that has, he has weighed upon us. Goodbye, goodbye, your poor Maximilian. So, ultimately, the decision to kill Maximilian, while controversial, gave this country, in my opinion, its first taste of a national identity in all those years since 1821 and 40 different um, presidential uh, administrations. Finally, for once, I think Mexico knew what it wanted. And soon after Juarez died, uh, Porfirio Diaz took over and governed for 30 years, the longest existing presidency in this country. And um, while he was not perfect by any means, it was Finally, a time that Mexico said to Europe, no more, we, we will not be colonized. And in fact, it was Monroe Doctrine, which is the unilateral policy that no European countries can colonize North America. And that has stuck with this country ever since. So if you can bring up the lights, I will take any questions if, you, if anyone's got it. Hi. Thank you very much. Very important. I have a simple question. Uh, are, you, are you aware, as a Texas historian and Mexican historian, of any group of uh, German unit in the Confederate Army that after the Civil War, after the Confederacy lost the Civil War, that the German unit went down to Mexico City and fought on behalf of Maximilian? Yes, there were a number of them that accepted. Um, and, and interestingly, not that many Germans really wanted to be Confederates. They wanted to be Union people in Texas because they were so self-reliant and they did not believe in slavery. But yes, there were quite a number that went down and they became mercenaries. Um, as did our, our, our Texas governor, Pendleton Murrah, who went down. Um, and uh, E. Kirby Smith, he's a general, he went down, a lot of them. But they, and they all settled up uh, uh, colony called Carlota, not all of them, but many of them. But it wasn't a success. And they tried their hands at bending fruit or shipping fruit, things like that. The, the reason I asked was because, is this still on? No. Yeah. Sorry. The reason I asked is, uh, my, we have no documents, but supposedly my great-grandfather was in such a unit in the Confederate Army 
went down, fought for Maximilian, and after losing there, went back to Germany. So you somewhat affirmed what that could have been. That was, it was a real scattering. And if you could, if you had enough money to make it back to Europe, a lot of people did that. A lot of people then, like John Bayhead and Gruder, he ended up in Mexico for a while, but then went to Cuba, where he just hung out for a little while and then made his way back. And they would, they would almost like sneak back into um, the United States. And they were supposed to take an oath of, uh, an oath to the federal government. A lot of them wouldn't do it. Never did, but a, a lot did do it. I mean, I think the more reasonable Confederates, the, the more, I, I think they knew they had to face the music, so they they rejoiced. And Reconstruction needed people. There were so many people killed during the Civil War. So this was this was why uh, Sheridan and Sherman were so adamant about getting uh, getting the French out of Mexico. Did you say anything about Carmody said there was more to the story? Does she go crazy in Europe? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, some people, when I started this project, they said, oh, she wasn't crazy. She's crazy like a fox. And, but she really was, I think, she, I think a lot of times there's a fine line between genius and madness. And she was a brilliant piano player. She was a brilliant mathematician. She just had, I think, it was some kind of bipolar situation. She had a terrible temper at times, and then she forgot it. And then she would do things like, um, supposedly, uh, walk, walk around naked, hitting herself with a cat of nine tails, you know, like penance, exposing herself to her guards. I mean, as soon as she went to go live with her brother, and he had had little kids, so they got her another castle called Bujo, 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 that's how you say it. And, um, she lived there the rest of her life, and uh, she saw the plane, uh, the first airplanes she ever saw were over that castle in World War I, and she turned to one of her, her nieces and said, this is going to be a complicated mess, and it, it, it will not end easily. And she was about to write. So she was very prescient about sort of things. She was so smart, and such a good, you know, when Maximilian was kind of fading out, um, not interested, more interested in his girlfriends and hanging out in Cuernavaca. She was trying to hold the whole place together, and she was really a genius about finance. So, um, yeah, so she was, she was crazy, sort of, but I think she could have had medication today. <laughs> I really do. I think so. Well, in regards to Maximilian, there's a, a, a bit of history here in San Miguel de Allende, if you may know. He spent two nights on the September the 13th and the 14th of 19, 1864, when he was on his way to Dolores on the, on the 15th to, to, for the first cry of independence, for the, for the Grito Independencia. So uh, he spent two nights and he uh, we have located the house. It is nowadays Casa Europa. It is on San Francisco Street, uh, number 23. That's where he slept and uh, there, there was a ball, a ball uh, one of the evenings in the, the, what was called the Casa Lapa, which is on the corner of San Francisco and uh, that other little street across the, the little plaza. So that, that's our, our time with Maximilian and Right, when he was getting directly, when he was preparing for that speech that he made from the home of Padre Hidalgo, he, he put on a Chinaco kind of outfit, you know, that he was going to speak in, and he looked at himself thinking, I, I look ridiculous. <laughs> that's the story that goes. But he rehearsed it. He was very nervous, though, about, about that. It's kind of an awkward moment. We have about time for about another two questions. Yes, as a follow-up to that, the Alamigo, which is uh, one of uh, one of uh, Guanajuato's major museums, uh, it had originally been built as a granary, and uh, it only served that function for about eighteen months or so. Uh, it became a fortress during uh, during the Mexican you know, War of Independence, but then. Maximilian converted from a military fortress to a prison. 
Right. They famously hung the heads of uh, the conspirators. <laughs> Disgusting. This will be our last question, but you can always come across the way to Italy uh, with us and talk to me. Uh, talk to you, Mary Margaret. Here. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the the Emperor Franz Josef, who uh, wrote to his brother Maximilian, telling him that he would not uh, uh, reinstate his title and his stipend, and then writing later on to say that. If it was fine, you could come back. I, I don't really know what to think about that because he he was trained. Franz Josef was trained under one of the strongest dictator military guys um, ever. Um, uh, his name is Radetzky. Um, you may know the Radetzky March. It's pretty famous in Austria. And for him to break down and show this sort of sympathy. I think maybe, all I can think of is that the mom may have persuaded him because he was very, very close with his mother. And um, I think there was a lot of pressure on the part. Franz Josef was not a popular leader. He had lost um, several battles right prior to this. And in fact, uh, when his army returned into Vienna, people were shouting, bring Maximilian back. You, you failed us. And so I think he was getting popular pressure as well. And so I think that I don't know how compassionate a guy he really was because he would have women flogged in the in the streets of Vienna. You know, not a super nice guy. So, but he had a beautiful wife. That's what everybody remembers about him. <laughs> and um, she's saying something. And so I don't know. It was also an era where uh, where. Monarchs were being stabbed and shot on a regular basis. It was the beginning of the end of the monarchy, if you will. And I think, which it didn't actually formally until World War I, but I think it was a, a popular move, maybe, but awkward and sad. So anyway, it was, it was a very strange uh, time for, for the world. And it really is world history, uh, not just Mexican. It's just where it all played out. So. But thank you all for coming. And I do like to